friends, welcome back to Lingering on the Lectionary, where we reflect on the life of the churches, the local academy, and the rhythm of the church's liturgy. Thanks for being here. Today I talk with Dr. Stephen Dempster about biblical theology, canon studies, and the literary artistry of the book of Genesis. Dr. Dempster is a giant in the field of biblical theology, and today he shares a trove of insights about method, theology, and practical wisdom. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Dr. Dempster. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to chat about some of your work in biblical theology and canon studies. Uh, but as an entry point to this to these areas, could you tell us a little bit about how you got your start in academia and also uh, perhaps what led you to a literary and canonical approach to biblical studies? Sure. Uh, I became a Christian um, early on and uh, but I, I I found that uh, when I went to university it was either sink or swim <laughs> and uh, so I really started living my faith out at a university a secular university a university at the time it was called University of Western Ontario in London and um, it was it's Western University now but uh, but I found that as I shared my faith uh, with people that they had a lot of questions and I didn't have any answers for. So one of the things I thought, well, well, I'll go to seminary. So I decided to go to Westminster Theological Seminary. And uh, as I um, spent my time down there, I became fascinated with the Old Testament, uh, particularly with a teacher that I had named Ray Dillard. Uh, he opened my eyes to things. And of course I had, I, I felt I didn't really know very much uh, and I still don't know very much, but, but I, I, um, I really got fascinated with the Old Testament. And so I thought that what I will should do after that was go for graduate studies. And I had actually planned to go to e to Israel to an old pan to learn modern Hebrew. Um, but it didn't work out because uh, of my Christian faith. They were suspicious of me going. Uh, the, the Israeli government was suspicious of me going to a kibbutz there. Anyway, so I didn't go, but I went to the University of Toronto. And uh, I studied um, ancient Near Eastern studies there, mainly focusing on Hebrew. Um, and as a result uh, of my work there, I, I then started to work at uh, Crandall, where I worked for 38 years here at the, uh, in Moncton. But what I found was, as I became very interested in the Old Testament canon, um, and as I read through the Bible, I had the opportunity to just take the Hebrew text and just read it through. I became fascinated with kind of the big picture. And, uh, and I realized, as I did a bit more study, that the New Testament was not just proof texting, you know, when it would actually look at these kinds of things. And so I, uh, I looked at the, uh, the Old Testament and I saw the big picture and I thought, this has been put together. You know, it's not uh, in, a, in a haphazard way. There's kind of a, um, uh, a sort of an editorial um, a mind there uh, that the Holy Spirit is used to, uh, to bring this material together. And uh, so I saw this kind of great big picture. And so when I started reading the New Testament, I was looking at passages and I was seeing, well, these passages are not just proof texting. It may seem like they're proof texting, but what they're doing is kind of invoking large contexts from the Old Testament. And so that uh, that really opened my eyes. It just really, really opened my eyes. And so I became very um, interested in the big picture. And uh, I hadn't seen, you know, when I had been at, at university, um, at University of Toronto, we had been taught very much kind of a, uh, microscopic exegesis of all of the, uh, you know, all the different criticisms uh, when we look at a passage, and uh, we wouldn't, uh, we we would never really see the forest for the trees, and I, I think uh, this really helped me being able to read and read and read widely uh, through the Old Testament to see the trees, uh, not to see the trees so much as the forest. And that that that's how I became very very much interested. And in fact, when I uh, I wrote a an essay called uh, oh I think it was geography and genealogy for a um, a colloquium uh, on biblical theology back in two thousand and one. And that's when I started putting together the idea of canon with uh, with biblical theology mm -hmm. and saying, boy, 
you know, the larger picture here is so, so important that we'll miss something if we don't really uh, see that larger picture. So anyway, that's kind of a long and the short of it. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's a, um, a good segue into uh, my next question, which was right around that time period that you're mentioning, uh, almost 20 years ago, you published uh, your major book, Dominion and Dynasty, A Theology of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. So as you reflect on uh, this particular work and how it's been received, uh, what would you say are some of the key points or some of the most important overall conclusions uh, that you established uh, in this yeah. study of the Old Testament? Yeah, well, um, I'm not, yeah, one of the things I would say is that it's at least brought to people's mind um, the uh, the use of the uh, Hebrew arrangement of scriptures as opposed to the, the Old Testament arrangement of scriptures. I've just written an article on um, the old, the Hebrew arrangement of scriptures for a, a, a book that's coming on out the state of the Old Testament, and this, so the state of the Old Testament canon. But there is kind of um, uh, this idea of the tripartite nature of the Hebrew Bible, where you get the law, the prophets, and the writings, as opposed to the kind of quadripartite uh, arrangement that we have with the, the law, the, the uh, historical books, the uh, poetic books, and the, the prophetic books. So I, I've really, uh, at least I think I brought that more to the focus. And in fact, there's been a recent book that's been published uh, a translation of the Hebrew scriptures called just simply the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just out uh, and uh, I write an introduction to it um, and um, and others have written introductions to their books, various books that they were assigned. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that um, that has been the case has been uh, um, people have often assumed that the Old Testament um, that we have, um, with that quadripartite structure is more eschatological than the uh, the Hebrew Bible with its uh, law, prophets, and writings. And I think there's a sense in which that's true because the prophets are pla the the writing prophets are placed at the very end of our Bible, uh, and that we we see that um, in very very early um, listings of the books. Uh, uh, we see that tendency to do that. For example, Daniel is placed at the end uh, of some of these, whereas uh, uh, etc. But my my um, my my feeling is that uh, that actually there's a very much of an eschatological uh, structure to the Hebrew Bible too, because it uh, it's the the last book if uh, in in one of the earliest arrangements of the Hebrew Bible, the last book is Chronicles and. Uh, Chronicles basically, uh, I, I think it kind of is a reflection on the whole Bible uh, because it starts with Adam and it ends with the exile and uh, Cyrus's plea for the uh, the Israelite, the people in in uh, Persia to go back to uh, to Jerusalem to build the temple. Uh, so I think in a way there's an eschatological thrust in that uh, because there is a looking to the future. Because if you read the prophets, this idea of going back to Jerusalem um, uh, for the exiles is when, when Yahweh will reveal his glory, like you read in Isaiah and Ezekiel and others, is when Yahweh's going to reveal his glory. So there is this idea of the glory of God is yet to be fulfilled here. Um, and, uh, and so when Jesus comes, um, uh, Jesus comes to, uh, in a sense, he, he comes to build the temple. Um, and it's really interesting if you look at Genesis, which is structured in the form of genealogies, and then you look at Chronicles, which has nine chapters of genealogies, and then the real history begins when David appears. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus is a kind of a, a new David, obviously. We see that from the genealogy, which begins in Matthew chapter 1, to verses 1 to 17. He is the new David. Um, Clearly, it begins with Abraham, goes to David, goes from David to the exile, goes from the exile to Jesus. And, and it's 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, which is the kind of the, the Hebrew uh, gematria for the name David, David. Uh, anyway, so Jesus is the new David. So I think there is an eschatological thrust in terms of the, the Hebrew Bible as well. Uh, it's not just the, the Old Testament has 
that eschatological thrust. The the uh, the Tanakh is what the Jews would call it. The, ha, has that eschatological thrust as well. Mm -hmm. Thinking about uh, what you do at the, in the beginning of Dominion and Dynasty, one of the things that's been extremely helpful for me as I've thought about this in this way is the way that you mentioned how st structure or the framework we we think of the big picture of the uh, of a collection shapes the way that we understand individual parts of that text. So one of your essays, I think it was in the Hearing the Old Testament uh, volume, uh, you mentioned the extraordinary emphasis on genealogy in Genesis yep. and the way that that's uh, connected to the theology and meaning of the book. Yeah. And I, I like this this approach that you've taken here in this in this work and then of course uh, your other work of taking parts of the Bible and these texts that are oftentimes the first places readers skip or skim over like yeah. the genealogy or yeah. or even thinking about a book like Chronicles as just a historical record that is just kind of repeating what Kings is doing, um, putting that in the context of not just historical books, but the prophetic history or seeing mm -hmm. that as a kind of a retrospective take on things. Um, that's one of the uh, a really helpful effect that, that your work here mm -hmm. has had. Well, yeah, and just to think of the, the Greek name for Chronicles, Paralipomena, the things which are left over, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to something which is a culmination of the whole, really, you know. Uh, and, I, you know, the thing is, if it's true that there is this, um, and, and one of the things I think that I tried to show anyway um, was the importance of David in the canon, um, in that uh, if you divide the canon in half, the Hebrew canon in half, the end middle part is when Jehoiakim is released from prison. So he's the Davidic monarch who is in prison. Um, and if you then come to the very end of the canon, you get uh, a focus on going to rebuild the temple. So, and of course, this brings together the idea of the two houses in 2 Samuel 7. God says, you're not going to build me a house, David. I'm going to build you a house and your son will build for me a house. And so you get this idea again of um, of the uh, Davidic Messiah and the temple connected. And I can't help but think of how Jesus is so powerfully connected to the temple mm -hmm. when he says that three days, you know, uh, you know, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. And and you get this idea in the early church of um, the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, we are the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Something that, that made me think of something you mentioned at the very end of Dominion Dynasty, just a, just a real brief glimpse of how you would think of this in the New Testament, where um, Jehoiakim is in a Babylonian prison, but he's um, he's thrown off his chains and he's uh, uh, the, the hope that a son of David still lives. And then thinking about the end of the uh, narrative section of the New Testament with Paul in prison in Rome, the new yeah. Babylon, yeah. Uh, proclaiming the word freely. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, thinking about that today, actually, uh, um, that uh, that Paul in Ephesians says, you know, I'm an ambassador in chains. He's talking about being in, I'm an ambassador in chains. And, you know, for us, we think of uh, that would be a. He's in prison. I mean, every person in prison has chains. Um, but he says this term ambassador. And in Rome, there were amba am ambassadors from other countries wore a golden chain, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what he's basically saying, I'm just like them. I'm in prison, but I'm I'm representing God. I'm representing um, the I'm an I'm an outpost of the out the outpost of heaven. So uh, that's what the church is. And and so he takes something which we would regard as something, um, you know, um, depressing and turns it into something hopeful, which is, uh, and then he says, pray for me that I might be have the ability to speak to someone in prison. You know, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just like you can't put them down, you know. Yeah. It's a good example of the way you can understand a New Testament text um, on its own terms in some ways, but if you are mindful of the intertextual connections that they're pointing us to, it can just make it uh, yeah. that much more vibrant. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you're thinking about the discipline of like biblical theology that you've continued to uh, participate in, especially among evangelicals who are, are caring about the, the message of the Bible uh, within the context of the churches as well, uh, w- what would you say are some of the major changes you've noticed from when you began writing and today? And maybe is there anything that's uh, either encouraging or concerning about uh, the current state of biblical theology? Well, I noticed that there's been a lot more um, interest and activity in biblical theology since I started this. Um, in fact, I I um, I always uh, yeah it, I I'm just not naturally drawn to to it to see the big picture. But I I know for example uh, that series by Don edited by Don Carson. Uh, there's probably over a hundred volumes in that now, if not more. That people have just, and people have just lapped it up, you know, so I think that's been a very positive development. Um, And I think for the overall good of the church, it is, because I see in a lot of the kind, and I'm not sure if this is, um, but I'll I'll just speak to it, but I see in a lot of the, um, the importance of biblical theology, I see the importance of biblical theology, because um, if you just simply have uh, a group of texts, um, it seems to me that you don't have a a coherent grasp of the whole. Like I was reading um, uh, Bruce Waltke's uh, Old Testament theology uh, just recently, and and I and I resonated with what he said that many many Christians have a collection of maybe ten texts. That's mm-hmm. what they have, and then they have their uh, you know their faith and that kind of thing. Um, and even before that, it would be the four spiritual laws. And um, but the danger of that is that um, you take uh, you take those things that these individual texts, and it's so easy to blend them in with the worldview of your culture, you know, mm-hmm. so that you're really uh, following the cultural story, the culture story, rather than the biblical story. And I and I see that so much that you know. Uh, when Jesus, I've been reading through the Gospels again because of this this book, but Jesus is constantly stressing the importance of the end, um, the uh, how the kingdom changes everything. It's like someone who finds a uh, a treasure in a field or a pearl of great price and sells everything that he has. Uh, and so, but that's that's all based on a whole understanding of uh, the kingdom, you know, mm-hmm. but it just have a few verses uh, that that are abstracted from it. Uh, you can almost make anything uh, um, fit in there and uh, you can you can um, you can be someone who's very schizophrenic, you know, uh, in terms of your understanding of life. You uh, basically accept the worldview of the world, but you have these few verses which assure you of heaven. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that that's a real danger, you know, and uh, and I, that's why I think in biblical theology is important for the church and important for the Christian, too. Mm-hmm. The second thing I would simply say is this, that biblical theology, because it, it uh, gives you the big picture, it also tells you what to major on and what to minor on mm-hmm. so that the tithe, the mint and the uh, the dill and the cumin, which Jesus talks about in uh uh, Matthew 23, where he says that he says to the Pharisees, "You tie the mint and the dill and the cumin, but you've forgotten you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith." And why was that? Because they looked at the scriptures as kind of individual texts that are all equally important. Now, don't get me wrong; it's all equally inspired, mm-hmm. but because it's put together, there are some things that are more important than others, and. Uh, and you would you would see that if you uh, you read the text. I mean, you'd see the importance of that and uh, the importance of justice and righteousness and uh, and uh, having a heart that's circumcised and all of these kinds of things, uh, as opposed to just doing these little duties. Um, mm-hmm. Not that the duties aren't important. It's just that you've you can put the emphasis on the the wrong syllable, you know. And I think that that overall view. Um, lets you know what the what the right emphasis is. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's a great word for uh, an individual believer um, reading their scriptures and thinking about the Christian life, but it's also a good uh, blueprint or mandate for uh, those ministering in the churches as the, we consider preaching and counseling yeah. and ministering to the people, mm -hmm. that kind of a canonical approach to preaching and uh, you know counseling as well. Well, I've been so so helped by your specific work in canon studies. Um, just staying on this just a little bit longer, uh, like in this area of may maybe a canonical or literary approach uh, to reading the scriptures, uh, reading and rereading. Um, how would you relate kind of what you're doing to someone uh, like Brevard Childs or John Salheimer? Yeah, well, I would say uh, with Brevard Childs. I mean, I really appreciated him and everything else, but I think that um, one of the things he really tried to hold on to was kind of a historical criticism, which um, which um, stressed the uh, the importance of trying to find the historical um, um, moment when the, these, this material was was written. But mind you, he he was concerned with the final form, which was was really important. And I would just simply say that um, oftentimes when you go that route, you find a difference between, um, let's say, for example, the historical Amos and the canonical Amos. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, um, when you get to the end of uh, Amos and you talk about the uh, rose and lavender instead of the blood and iron, um, most people, and probably Childs included, would argue that um, that that's not Amos, that's not the historical Amos. Uh, the historical Amos could not have written that, or you know, there are other examples where it's clearly not the historical person, but the canonical Amos did, you know. So to me, when you pit a, a division between the canon and history like that, you you uh, you you cause all kinds of problems, I think, uh, because I'm, I really, yeah, in the canonical Amos then is an historical fiction, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and you find, for example, in, in works on prophecy, for example, by um, uh, uh, people like um, Ehud Ben Zvi, uh, who will argue that uh, these prophetic books that we have, have nothing to do with the original prophetic author but they're created by literati three or four centuries later who present them as if they are historical. Well, to me, that's that's deception and I can't I can't buy that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess with John, I'm far more sympathetic to his work and it's it's really been influential in my life. And I don't know if there's a, there's all that much difference between us um, in terms of our understanding of uh, of the Bible, I've really appreciated his his work on um, uh, introduction to canonical theology or, or introduction to the I forget what it's called the mm -hmm. the one on canon and Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, I really really appreciated that book and uh, and I was in correspondence with him before he died at, at many times and uh, meeting him at conferences and I feel that we were basically on the same journey. Um, and uh, sometimes I thought maybe that he depreciated the historical, but uh, but I um, you know I, I I feel I'm a lot more in agreement with him than I would be with with a person like Childs. Mm -hmm. We're talking about some of the big picture ideas, but you've also done some serious exegetical work in Old Testament books and commentaries or journal articles and preaching. Um, and you've done work uh, in Genesis as well. Thinking about you know someone studying a book like Genesis, a narrative like Genesis, uh, what are what do you think are some of the strategies or reminders that a student or a preacher should keep in mind when studying uh, this book? Uh, I think one of the things is try to uh, uh, read it a few times, the entire book, and I think that you will see that there is a structure which emerges with these told out or these uh, these are the generations of you'll find the first one in Genesis 2 4 the second one in chapter 5 verse 1 and you'll find uh, roughly I think there's 11 in Genesis but 10 almost function as chapters and uh, and so you see uh, uh, these are 
tracing the line of human beings. Um, uh, but you will see Genesis 1, 1 to 2, verse 3 is kind of an introduction to the whole uh, because it's outside that uh, those genealogies. It's outside those genealogies. So it's kind of an introduction to the whole uh, stressing, uh, I would say, almost like uh, an overture in a symphony. In a symphony, but but uh, but so you would see that, and then the very first genealogy that you get is um, these are the gene genealogies of the heavens and the earth. And so, whenever you get one of these genealogies, it always points back to something. And this is the only genealogy where you have non-human participants. Uh, these are the genealogies of the he heavens and the earth. And so what I think is happening there is simply uh, that now that the, uh, the the heavens and earth have been created, um, what you're doing now is you're starting a history of humanity. You know, you're starting the history of the, of the earth here. And so these are historical kind of historical accounts. So I think in a way to divide it up that way, you see uh, the kind of interest of the narrator where he's tracing a line and I think this is really, really important because one of the um, promises which is given on the curse of the serpent is that there will be a, a descendant from the line of the woman that will uh, crush the head of the serpent or the, ser the seed of the serpent. And if that's the case, then you should be expecting something about the descendants in the future. It sets that up. And so, you're, you know, you as you work through this, you find uh, this genealogy of Adam in chapter five, and then this genealogy of the Noah, and then this of his sons, and then finally you get to Tira in chapter eleven, and uh, and then the whole thing uh, develops. Another thing I could uh, you will you will find if you look at this larger structure, you will see that uh, a lot of history or a lot of time is compressed in um, in the first eleven chapters. And then uh, thousands and thousands of years, you know, and then what you have in chapter 12, beginning with Abraham to chapter 24 or so, you get like, uh, ch well, chapter 12 to 25 or chapter 12 to 22 is like 25 years. So mm -hmm. that you get, you get, uh, uh, you get, uh, so the writer is showing you what his interest is. His interest is in Abraham, the story of Abraham, and it's the interest in Jacob. Uh, the story of Jacob and the interest in the story of Joseph. So he speeds through with these mm -hmm. early genealogies, vast tracts of time in order to get you to the uh, the main event, as it were, the story of Abraham. That somehow in this man is going to come the uh, the solutions to the problems that are that have afflicted the race in chapters three to eleven. Any anyway, those are some, some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's really, really important to uh, to try to look at the whole and, and everything in terms of the whole, because if you don't, um, you can easily be led off into eisegesis instead of exegesis. And you say a few times in uh, some of your uh, articles and essays, the uh, important first step in any methodology for studying a book is reading and rereading uh, yeah. strategic strategic readings and noting where the author speeds up where he slows down uh, yeah. it's kind of a whiplash if you're not ready for it but you really can't get that sense unless yeah. you're reading large chunks of text at a time yes that that's so right you know and you know having thought about that i just uh you know i was listening to someone talk about recent uh issues ethical issues um in a church and uh and i got a sense what they were doing they were looking at passages in genesis uh, but they were isolating them from each other. And when they were being isolated from each other, you can almost, uh, you know, it. you separate them. And as a result, you do not see how they are connected. And, uh, and you can make false conclusions based on that. One example that I like to use in class uh, is Genesis 38 with the story of, of Judah and Tamar. Uh, because it's it's odd. Um, there's lots of stuff going on there. In some ways, it's graphic, and it's an obscure text. And I've heard many sermon series on um, the Joseph story that don't include uh, Genesis 38, uh, because it seems to just break up such a pristine yeah. narrative. So how would how do you think like thinking about hermeneutics and just this approach to the text? How would it help us 
uh, work through a, a text like this that most readers either don't know what to do with or just kind of skip over? Yeah, well, you know, I, I remember reading a long time ago, Robert Alter on that text, and it opened my eyes so much, even though he's not a, um, an Orthodox Jewish scholar, or, um, but if just from a literary point of view. Um, and one of the things that you see if you read the Joseph story, one of the, the longest speech in the Joseph story is Judah's speech in chapter 44, mm -hmm. where they've been caught with this cup. And, uh, you know, Joseph has actually intended to bring about a test, uh, which will be the, exactly the same as what happened to him. Uh, Benjamin, uh, his full blood brother, uh, he's told uh, he's told the brothers that he's going to keep him and they can go back scot free to their father. And Judah has pledged to his father that he will pledge his life on the line for Benjamin. And so he has the longest speech in Genesis, and it's a wonderful speech of how, and we remember that Judah in chapter 37, at the end, before chapter 38, at the end of chapter 37, was someone who uh, was the one who actually sold, uh, mm -hmm. who came up with the plan, not to kill Joseph, but to make a profit from him, and send him to, uh, send sell him to traders, and then bring and keep the money and then uh, then take his 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 coat, rip it up, put goat blood on it and take it back to his father. And his father would have the conclusion that uh, mm. that his son was killed. And Judah did that with a very, very hard heart, a very hard heart. And so you're seeing uh, someone in chapter 44 who is uh, who's changed entirely. He says, let me stay I will stay in place because I can't go back to my father without Benjamin, you know. Mm -hmm. And so his he's his whole heart's been changed. And of course, that makes Joseph finally reveal his identity. He he sees the moral transformation which has taken place. Well, then mm -hmm. go back to chapter 38, and you see some of the beginning of that moral transformation. Because and again, it's on a part of it's on the uh, I, before we go back to chapter 38, though, I should go to the end of the book of Joseph, where mm -hmm. jo uh, where um, Jacob is pronouncing a blessing on each of the sons. And he says, Judah will be someone from whom uh, uh, to whom the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 scepter will belong and the obedience of the peoples will be his. And it, it seems to suggest that it's from Judah's line that uh, you're going to get uh, um, salvation for the world, you know. Uh, so, so, but what, why is Judah so important? Well, you go back to Genesis 38, and you see a, this strange situation of Judah marrying a Canaanite woman, um, and his son is marrying Tamar, who's a Canaanite. Uh, it, it has, uh, um, so you get uh, Er, uh, he does something, God kills him, that displeases God. Onan, of course, practices his uh, birth control method, uh, which God uh, um, doesn't accept, and and he dies. And then, and then uh, it's the responsibility of the father to give the um, give the next child to the the woman Tamar. Well, she he's not that old, and he thinks there's no way this is going to happen because she is a widow maker. That's exactly what. <laughs> He concludes, but and so then he she sees what's going to happen, and she actually seduces uh, uh, the father when his wife dies, uh, Judah, and uh, she she seduces him for a purpose. Though she wants to make sure that there's someone from the line of heir that will continue the line, mm -hmm. and uh, so you you remember what happens. Um, she uh, she brings the uh, he can't pay after the sexual act, so he gives her his signature, uh, his identity card, which is his uh, um, uh, cylinder seal, I think it would be, and uh, also his staff. Uh, and as a result of that, um, uh, she he sends he gives that as a down payment, and then goes back, and then he sends back a goat to uh, to pay for his uh, his act. And um, and she's no longer there. And of course, she gets pregnant. 
And then when she's three months pregnant, they say to Judah that uh, uh, your daughter is uh, daughter in law is pregnant. And he says, bring her out and burn her, you know, and uh, and then she says she has the quickness to realize she, this is why I needed these things. And she gave gives the the, the scepter and the cylinder seal, as it were, to uh, to uh, and says, by the hands of these, the, the people, the person who owns these. Um, I'm pregnant. And then Judah sees it. Now, he could have denied it. He could have denied it. But he says, she's more righteous than I. Mm -hmm. And she he confesses to being the, the person that has done this. And they have children, Paris and Netzron. And uh, and so so there is a sense in which he is his, the more his moral transformation is happening. And there is a line the the line of air is continued. The line of Judah is continued. Uh, through the work of this woman. Now, if you look at the context, uh, if you look at the context of that, it's really interesting because in the next chapter, chapter 38 or 39, Joseph is in um, Potiphar's house and he is, there's a, a, he's being seduced by, um, by Potiphar's wife and she's only interested in sexual gratification. That's the only thing she's interested in. Whereas, Tamar is interested in preserving the line, and uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, yeah, so so uh, she and she uses she rips the cl clothing mm -hmm. off Joseph, and she uses that as evidence against him. Uh, and uh, and of course, it's a, lie, a total lie. So there is a contrast in there, mm -hmm. but I guess in terms of you're you're beginning to see the moral transformation of Judah but also the preservation of Judah's line here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a lot more that could be said, but but clearly it's not the work of a sleeping redactor, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, chapter 38. It's connected yeah. integrally to the text. And, you know, there is a there is a, 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 a really great article on this by Lou Silberman, uh, and it's called Listening to the Text. Mm -hmm. He's a Jewish scholar, and it's called Listening to the Text. And he basically points out how that you were right, that most scholars see this as the work of, well, it has to be a sleeping redactor, you know, because it they just see that radical disjunction. And I think this shows us that we, uh, and this is, the, I think, the world work of John Selheimer, when you put things together, mm -hmm. um, it almost requires you to make sense of them. You know, and he sees that in types of movies and things like that. When you put things together like that, it requires you to make sense. And so you have to ask yourself in the scriptures, why are these things put together? So when you're a pastor and you're reading the Gospels, why are these two texts, why do these two texts follow one another? Mm -hmm. What is the significance of this? You know, uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, you should be asking yourself. How does the, what's the author trying to do here? Um, yeah. That's really helpful. And I've always thought, too, that the Judah story and just kind of the, the scandalous nature in some ways of those those texts, it kind of creates the the dynamic of the mystery of providence where, you know, you're kind of expecting at the when in Jacob's blessing that the lion would come from the tribe of Joseph um, mm -hmm. because of he seems to be the rock star of the yeah. end of Genesis. And yet yeah. the promise comes through through Judah. Um, it's, it creates kind of that dynamic that's going to be traced out in the rest of the prophetic history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that the the last person that you would expect um, that would be the descendant of David would be Solomon. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you, you, there's no way that you'd expect that he would be the next king, given the 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 sordid nature of the whole thing. You know, uh, it's just like. Uh, I guess that these are signs of incredible hope that out of the ash heap uh, mm. comes uh, comes something that God's going to make a new world with. Mm -hmm. And that resonates with your earlier point about the extraordinary emphasis on genealogy in the scriptures, where you see Tamar uh, and Judah show up in Ruth and also Matthew's genealogy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at that, that, you know, those genealogies and. Bathsheba's there, you know, and uh, Tamar and uh, and Ruth, and they're all kind of tinged in a way. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, and, and that's an amazing thing, because when you look at genealogies, very rarely do you have women in them. One of the things we've been talking about in class this semester is uh, when looking at a genealogy is to notice the pattern and then also pay careful attention where, where the pattern deviates. Um, yes. So yes. Seeing the, the women in the genealogy, but also these um, uh, Gentiles uh, are included in the line of, of yeah. the Messiah where, you know, the, a Moabite. Um, a Canaanite, you know, things of that yeah, nature. Exactly. It's, it's a beautiful picture of the gospel message that Messiah oh, yeah. would bring. You know, I was just uh, looking over the Genesis 5 genealogy, and there you see that he died, he died, he died, he died, he died, but then Enoch, he was translated, you know, because he walked with God. And and it's really interesting, you know, that um, even when you look at the the, the numbers there, the day, the, the day, ages, um, at, uh, Adam dies when Noah is born. Mm. So and Noah is kind of a new Adam. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, um, Methuselah dies in the year of the flood. And uh, it's kind of so interesting in that, that what changed Enoch was the birth of Methuselah at 65 mm -hmm. years old. It changed. It says that's when he began to walk with God. And you wonder if he knew if God revealed to him that there was coming this uh, this flood, this deluge, uh, and that and you know his son was the kind of uh, a sign of that. Anyway, it's interesting. You know, they can do a lot of things with that kind of stuff if you go deep enough. Yeah, yeah. we've kind of already been talking about some of the ways that biblical theology and just kind of a reading and rereading of text in this way, this close reading can shape uh, ministry within the context of the local church. Um, are there any uh, just general words that you would give to someone that is training for ministry or uh, pastoring in our world um, uh, in ways that this approach to the Bible can uh, help shape their ministry? Yeah, well, I think it can. Um, well, yeah, um, the, someone has described wisdom as a, uh, a sense of integration and a sense of proportion in that um, integration is where you see all the facts together. Um, proportion is where you see some some facts are more important than others so that, um, you know, uh, um, 4 BC is more more important than, let's say, uh, 2016, you know. Uh, in terms of world history, but this idea, and it's it's and and when you don't have integration, which is really what biblical theology is, I think you're integrating everything. You're trying to see it in its development and its coherence. Then it's easy to um, to pick on uh, you know things that uh, that aren't that important. And we've talked about this before. Um, but for example, you know, I I've been doing some work on. Um, the revelation of the divine name. Uh, but, it, you know, in Genesis or in Exodus 34, God reveals his name to Moses um, as Adonai, Adonai, um, Eric, Apayim, Varav, Hesed, or how's it go? El Rakum, va El, uh, El Hanun, uh, Eric, Apayim, Varav, Hesed, va Emet, and it goes on there. Um, but it says, I am Yahweh, Yahweh, a God of um, mercy and compassion. Um, who is uh, a length, who is, who is uh, long suffering um, and uh, full of Hesed Emmet, and who maintains Hesed for thousands of generations um, by forgiving iniquity for uh, transgression and sin, but by who no means acquits the guilty, but uh, visits the sons of the sins of the fathers to their sons to the third and fourth generation. Now, that is God's revelation of himself. He actually exegetes himself there. And I would say uh, it's a high water mark in the Old Testament because that text is used, I'd say, at least a dozen times in the Old Testament about God's nature. So it, that's clearly an important text. Um, and, and if you're doing, like, say, a systematic theology, you what you can see is this is one text of many. But when you're doing biblical theology, this is a revelation of the divine name. And so it's it's like a mountaintop experience, you know, and literally that Moses yeah. had. Uh, so that's really, really important. Um, and uh, and so what that does, then it becomes a means by which 
you see God's revelation of himself and uh, it, it, it holds the mercy of God out there very strongly, but also God's justice. And uh, that's something that um, the mercy of God comes first, but the justice and holiness of God are there too. And you need to hold those things together as you work through the Bible, because mm -hmm. oftentimes what you do is you just take one and then you and you don't bring the two of them. But but I guess uh, if I were to um, give portraits, if, if you're giving portraits of God in a in a kind of um, in a kind of a, a scrapbook, as it were, a photograph book, uh, you've got all these various portraits of God. But well, this should be actually right near the beginning, mm -hmm. but also uh, um, um, but also uh, even larger would be the cross and Christ, where all of this is resolved, you know, and uh, and it says in in John's gospel, grace and truth, uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, the law, the grace and truth came by Moses, too. Um, mm -hmm. But the high idea is simply that in the light of the revelation of what's happened in Christ, um, it seems as if that glory of the uh, what happened even in Exodus 34 has been greatly eclipsed because Moses saw only the back of God, where in the New Testament he sees the face of God in Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a a glory there that surpasses uh, the old the the Old Testament view. So I think. Uh, for someone who's studying in ministry is to see the development as it goes through scripture, the mountaintops, the valleys, as one works through, and then as one uh, heads toward the New Testament. I, I am just, uh, you know, I'm working through this book on the kingdom of God. One of the things I see over and over, though, like when Jacob has the uh, ladder experience and he sees the uh, the angels coming down, he didn't know <laughs> that Jesus would use that text. To Nathaniel and and Nathaniel uh, clearly what Jesus says I see an Israelite in whom there is no guile well that's a reference to Jacob if there mm -hmm. ever was one because there was an Israelite in whom there was guile but mm -hmm. also you're going to see greater things you're going to see heaven and open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man so I'm the greater Jacob but uh, uh, and then you're going to see this uh, Nathaniel I'm going to be the one who's going to unite heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but so there is this ratcheting up and ramping up of all of these images as you work your way through the Old Testament. And you're only able to see that when you uh, when you see it as a whole. Mm -hmm. Just the way you describe that as well. It's, it has a, the power to shape a ministry, but also just shape a life as oh, working yeah. through those texts. So, Yeah. One of the things I wanted to share, though, was just how, for example, in this recent um, uh, issue where the church uh, deals with... Uh, uh, ethical issues, this particular presentation that I was seeing um, was two hours long, and they were trying to uh, uh, deal with the issues of gender and uh, sexuality and all these kinds of things. And th their approach was very uh, piecemeal. They would take texts and they would um, not really look at their context. But for example, in Genesis 1, uh, it says male and female. But because it doesn't uh, list all of the various uh, species of animals, it's not exhaustive. And so the conclusion is that the genders uh, are, by saying male and female, are not exhaustive, you know. And I mean, that's, you can almost say anything uh, when, you, uh, when you do that kind of thing. And then when they go to Genesis 2, they said, uh, well, this is not really about marriage. It's about uh, uh, loneliness and uh, human social social bonds and that kind of thing. Uh, and yet, so what they do then, uh, and there is a truth to that, but it clearly has to do with marriage. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. And of course that ignores passages like uh, Paul, when he deals with in the new Testament, when he's dealing with prostitution, when he says that a person that is joined to a prostitute, uh, becomes one with her, which goes back to Genesis 2. Like, the Bible's all integrated, you know? Um, you can't just separate it like this. And when you are able to see how that, that integration, it can lead you, it, it can keep you from going astray. So, for example, uh, people say, 
you know, the fall is really not uh, is not there in the Old Testament uh, because it's just disobedience and, and this kind of thing. But it, but that's because they take uh, a passage like Genesis three and isolate it from the rest. And uh, and you see, for example, in Genesis six, the before the flood, the heart of man is evil, you know, uh, mm -hmm. continually. And then in chapter eight, it says the same thing. Uh, so when you're looking at all these texts in integration, you're able to see the development from Genesis 3 through the rest of the Bible. So I would simply say it's because of the lack of integration that they're able to make these conclusions anyway. Mm -hmm. Pressing issues in our culture um, yeah. coming into dialogue with a, a big picture reading of the Bible. Yeah. Well, I could, uh, I would love to do this for several more hours, but yeah. I want to respect your time as well. Yeah. But I'd like to conclude these uh, episodes with a kind of a general reflective question. Um, and we've kind of been working through this all along, really, but uh, there's a lot going on in our world that's very discouraging. Um, but what is something that you've experienced or reflected upon recently that, that gives you hope? Well, I tell you, uh, I, I was really um, touched the other day uh, when an old student came by, he lives in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, um, and I had him about 20 years ago. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, I taught him uh, for four years at, uh, at Crandall, and he went on, and he's a park ranger. He went to Hawaii, he was a park ranger there, and he's now a park ranger down in, um, in uh, South Carolina. And he... Uh, is attending a Presbyterian church there where he's an elder. And uh, he's actually uh, using a lot of the stuff that uh, uh, I taught him uh, in his preaching and that kind of thing. And it, it really, really struck me, you know, how uh, uh, this this young man, uh, well, he's probably in his 40s now, but he, uh, uh, someone I just kind of invested in, uh, and yet he's having a great influence on this little Presbyterian church down in uh, in South Carolina. And that that really, really encouraged me the other day. And it just shows you, I think, uh, one of the things that have been struck has, has struck me in the uh, the parables of Jesus is this idea of uh, sowing the seed, uh, because, uh, you know, if you sow the seed, um, there's going to be a harvest someday. And Jesus uses that analogy of the uh, the uh, um, the woman who needs the uh, the the yeast in the in the flour, and then the the mustard seed that grows into a great tree. And I guess those things of Christ uh, have really, really in, um, are really, really important in seeking justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with your God. Not don't be don't worry about being a celebrity or trying to make all just do the little things and uh faithfully and god will bless and and i guess that example today uh i used about a, the ambassador in my chains my wife mm -hmm. and i were in that passage this morning and and i remember uh years ago i was uh, uh asked by my dad to write a little bible uh number of bible lessons on ephesians for uh daily vacation bible school and and i was often i struck i was so struck by Paul's perspective, he saw these chains, which should have got him depressed. Mm -hmm. So this, this is evidence of, uh, uh, I'm an ambassador of the, of the new king, you know, I'm here. Uh, and I think so much we get depressed, but we can, uh, because we look at our experience, but, but we have such great examples. And of course, the resurrection, <laughs> mm -hmm. the res Jesus is still alive. <laughs> He's not dead. He's, doing as well he's work and he's on his way so uh and we just have to be ready wow that's a, a beautiful and powerful way to kind of draw in several of the things we've talked about um today well thank you again dr dempster for joining us and uh your work in ministry has certainly uh been one of those persevering agents in my faith and uh certainly sown seeds in my thinking and teaching and scholarship um, but anyone that listens to me and has read your work uh, will uh, recognize your ghost uh, roaming the halls of, of my uh, <laughs> my speech and thinking. So thanks, thanks so much for taking the time out today as well. 